is the player hot on his heels, Yuta Takahashi. Yeah, Let's take a look a... at the opening hand here. This is going to be a pretty good one if uh, <laughs> that's what we're going to see here from Takahashi. Two faithless lootings. Yes, please. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. A super strong hand um, from both players, really. We see these main deck cling to dust, which are extremely good against Arclight Phoenix and already just a good card. You know, just being able to one mana, draw a card, cycle through your deck, but these certain opportunities where you have something like Arclight go to the graveyard, being able to stop that before it comes into play is, is going to be exactly what Matt needs outside of these Narsets. Yeah, and I was going to ask, do you think knowing that Matt Sperling has main deck graveyard hate would lead to a change in game plan here for you to Takahashi, you know, rather hard casting the Arclight Phoenix, or is it just business as usual and hope that he doesn't have it? It's definitely going to be on Yuta's mind, and it, it might be a situation where Yuta waits to Faithless looting and discard the Phoenix until the turn you're supposed to bring it back. Mm -hmm. But with how his hand was there, let, that's a, a clunky four drop. Even if your plan is to hard cast it, it's still <laughs> the worst card in your hand. So that one seemed kind of easy to discard, but it's definitely going to be something on his mind for sure. Brainstorm there from Matt Spurling, one of the uh, standout cards from the Mystical Archive alongside Faithless Looting. And just seeing the impact that those cards have made on the historic format. Yeah, Mystical Archive, just incredible. It just juiced up this historic format <laughs> and just created so many powerful decks. Um, you know, I mean, we even saw the Strixhaven Championship. I, I was just watching just in awe at how powerful those decks were when you had time work. And even with getting rid of that, these Brainstorm decks are still showing that they are a force to be reckoned with for sure. Certainly so, as Brainstorm here is going to be fired off. The Fable Passage was found there and we'll be able to shuffle away the cards that Yuta puts back. It's going to be the little Sprite Dragons, it seems, uh, that get sent back along with a copy of Faithless Looting. Uh, quite happy to draw those again, though, so we'll opt back into the card on the top, which is going to be the Sprite Dragon after the Scry. And I can't uh, stress enough how big of a matchup this is, especially for Utah. You know, Matt Sperling looking like he's completely set so far, has a good lead, has decided to do some winnings uh, on this day, unlike the other <laughs> leader from the MPL who can't pick up a win in the hands of Seth Manfield. But Utah is in a tie for second right now. So every single match like this is huge at who's going to get that second spot. Yeah, certainly a close race here for the rivals right now. As a little Sprite Dragon hits the battlefield, may meet its end in a fatal push. Does Matt Sperling want to get rid of it right now? Or is he happy to just take one? He's happy to let the one damage through. And no follow-up here potentially from Yuta, keeping open the Brazen Borrower for a bounce. Yeah, pretty awkward draw there a little bit from Utah to not have a, another play, was thinking that maybe the Sprite Dragon was going to die and decided to not to play it. And now he's even considering just playing a, a, a post-combat Sprite Dragon, which is a little odd. But also I want to bring some attention to Matt's hand. Matt had it so lined up where he was going to brainstorm into that second blue for Narset to really do some damage and just <laughs> brainstormed into all swamps. So pretty unlucky there for Matt. Uh, and he's definitely going to be hoping this other brainstorm will feed him a little bit better news. Yeah. So a counter and a fatal push deal with both Sprite Dragons and another Narset off the top of the library there for Matt Sperling. But he does find the Watery Grave to get the second blue online for Narset. That was really big because if we were just not being able to interact and not being able to, let's say, either leave up dispute for either a finale of promise or a Stormwing entity. Matt could have fell far behind here, but now being able to not only have access to blue for mystical dispute or and or Thoughtseize here to be able to take a peek, this really gives Matt a lot more control over this game with having that kind of perfect information. Thoughtseize is gonna take care of the finale. So no triple spells there for Yuta. Unfortunately, doesn't have the Arclight Phoenix in the bin to be able to benefit off of that. So could potentially see Faithless looting into a storming entity. It's very powerful when that uh, five drop gets reduced. 
Yep, absolutely. And if, if we did have that arc light Phoenix, it seems like kind of a no brainer to start with this uh, faithless looting. Utah also just has the option right now. If he doesn't want to use faithless looting, just hard cast storming entity, you know, mm -hmm. feels bad. But if you really don't want to discard your other cards, then maybe you just have to be okay with it. Brazen bar is not that good in this matchup, but it's one of the, there's a few answers, but there's not a ton to Narset once it's stuck and being able to bounce that is pretty relevant. Yeah, Lots getting Narset off the battlefield and just, uh, you know, it's it's not great because you're, you're essentially giving Matt Sperling another look with Narset, another turn on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. So ideally, you'd like to just be able to kill it straight away, um, especially if there's not a big turn of uh, card draw and trying to get as many cards cost as possible to get the Arclight Phoenixes out. Exactly. And one card that, you know... We, we talked about even a little when we were in Standard, where we were talking about Frostbite's comparison to Lightning Bolt. That's exactly what these Arclight Phoenix decks want to deal with <laughs> Narset. That would have been ideal, but deemed too powerful for Historic. <laughs> so Narset's on the battlefield now, so Yuta's going to pay close attention to when he's drawing his second card, because he won't be able to, courtesy of Dear Narset. And takes a look on top of the library, finds two replacements, as well as another Cling to Dust and is going to opt to keep the second copy of Narset in hand. Ooh, I'm, spray. Okay. I'm really liking this uh, choice to bring this Demir control deck. You know, every single matchup, I just keep thinking, I was like, wow, you know, except for that Auras versus Demir, um, mm -hmm. every other matchup I see Demir paired up against, and I'm just like, wow, that seems like a really good matchup. And it kind of seems like the same for Izzet. You just see that Narset activation, and you're like, okay, which one of these devastating cards for Izzet Phoenix do I want to pick here? They're all bad news <laughs> for Utah's deck. So some a really good deck choice, I think, um, by everyone who brought Demir control um, from the team CFB. Yeah, and a favorite this weekend in the Rivals League. It's yeah, it's a little. Uh, I was a little unsure as to what would take the place of the Indomitable Creativity decks with the Time mm -hmm. Warps and Velamarcus Lorehold. You know, Jeskai turns was essentially, you know, made redundant with the banning of Time Warp. So yeah. And yeah, now that deck has transformed into this teamer deck that, you know, my mm. brother's playing and I watched that in action and it's really good too, you know? I mean, that deck is still very powerful, um, but realizing that just the Demir control cards are just a little bit better maybe. And I think it was a really nice tech choice. Narset, once again, taking a dig through the top of the library. What does Matt Sperling see? He finds a search for his Kanta, so that is a very powerful card. Even just having the uh, Surveil-esque effect at yeah. the beginning of the turn, but uh, also being able to dig through and uh, Yuta recognizing that that needs to get out of here. Yeah, and just already get that free value off Brazen Borrower. Now you mm -hmm. get to attack down Narset. This is a huge exchange yeah. here. And oh, now man. Crackling Drake actually gets to draw a card, even if it's going to die to that Doom Blade. You get to get all these cards out of your hand that yeah. Narset shuts down. Yeah, and being able to opt as a follow-up too. If Narset's around, none of that happens. So yeah. it's okay. I mean, Cracking Drake effectively replaced itself. Sure, you don't get another massive pigeon, but you do get another look at the top card of your library. And we saw Matt with a little eye roll there, you know, kind of hinting to me <laughs> that he thinks he made a mistake there. And there was the option to just play Narset and not um, activate it at all. And then mm -hmm. that wouldn't have happened. Maybe if that's what he's considering. Um, I don't know. The Doomblade is going to take care of the biggest threat on the battlefield for the time being. That's the Crackling Drake. And the next copy of Narset is just going to hang out for now as Search for Scanta hits the battlefield once again. Yeah, Search for Scanta, one of those cards that's been like a one of in these control decks, uh, you know, for the last uh, year or so. Yeah. And we all remember it in standard where that was an auto include four of with Teferi. <laughs> it was just so powerful. Um, Matt Sperling deciding to play two, just thinking it's even better in this style deck where all you're doing is answering threats. You know, Jeskai, you're trying to gain advantage with Teferi. You're trying to gain advantage with, you know, maybe Gideon as your planeswalker. And you're playing to the battlefield a little more in these actual control style decks. Search for his count of value goes even up or even higher up when you can just respond. If not activate as Kanta, it's a very scary thing to have to deal with. Faith is looting is going to draw two more cards. We're likely to see a discard here of the Ox of Agonis. Needs to be wary of that cling to dust, though. Yeah, 
if he wants to play that, he's got to get it out pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I'm actually thinking maybe he's just going to do it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Just before there's a response, I like this right here. If he were to play Opt or Brainstorm, which you would probably, you know, you'd think about doing before you aux, mm -hmm. um, maybe hide your best card on top of your library so you know you're drawing that. That would be the ideal play. But Matt playing it really smart there. He was even given the option here of, you know, playing it with Ox on the stack or you play it with the trigger on a stack. This was pretty heads up. Now, there was no time when Matt could have played Kling the from his hand to deal with that ox. So a really heads up play. Yeah. Holding full control here in response to the ox of Agonis trigger. Brainstorm is going to ensure that he draws what he wants and the rest will get discarded. This is great. You get to opt, get yourself another spell and then discard this Arclight Phoenix to ox. And if uh, my eyes aren't deceiving me, I'm pretty sure that was the third spell. And we should have a phoenix coming back. Quack! <laughs> there yep. we go. Wow, Your eyes what a do swing. not deceive. What a good turn here for Yuta Takahashi. Able to swing in for six, getting a 5-3 down on the battlefield, and an extra handful of cards. Doomblade will take care of that ox, but, uh, you know, if uh, Cling to Dust doesn't take care of it, we could well see it later. Sertra's Canter, though, is going to flip. There are enough cards for Kling to take care of the Ox, and now Matt Sperling will be able to dig through his deck and find the cards he needs to control this battlefield. Yeah, and it all comes down to if if there's time to do so. That Fetid Pool mm -hmm. is actually quite a bad draw as far as lands go. You just wanted to really have an untapped land because now Sperling's in the situation where you have to play Narset here just to be able to find answers to these flyers, but it's easily beaten right now. So that Ooh. is, uh, it's pretty tricky for him. Expressive Iteration, one of the better, in inverted commas, ex uh, card draw spells uh, where you yeah. don't actually draw with this. So it gets around Narset. Yeah, Expressive Iteration is just phenomenal in these style of decks. You know, we saw um, some other decks playing less expressive iterations you know like manguchi's deck uh manguchi's is it deck earlier mm. but just not the style of deck you wanted when it, any any deck like this where you're playing a lot of spells it just fits in so perfectly yeah so a handful of lands and a fry is what yush is working with we'll be able to take care of narset should he wish to go for the ox of agonis it's got enough cards in the graveyard to escape it Probably three times over, so I imagine he's been drawing <laughs> a lot ten. of cards. <laughs> yeah, I think so, the name of the game here is just you want another threat on the battlefield. Even if yeah. you're giving up the value of Fry, sure, there's that shark there, but already that shark can be a 6-6, six, six, so Fry is kind of not useful anyways. Mm. So Fry's going to go away, and Ox of Agonis sends the hand back into the bin and finds a Faithless Looting along with two lands. Loot, precious loot. Not two cards gonna get best. discarded. Yeah, kind of kind of mediocre lootings there. Yeah, not, ideally, not ideal, but still plenty of stuff going on here from Yuta and, and definitely Yuta Takahashi's game to lose here. We'll see if we get our beloved hard cast here. That is the way to win these matchups. Oh, yes. When just one creature isn't going to be enough, and it, it kind of doesn't seem like it is. I love the hard cast. Hard cast okay. shark typhoon from Sperling. Everything that he costs now is going to trigger that and make some sharks for him. Has Oof. the cling to dust in hand. Will be able to gain some life or draw a card, depending on what he exiles. But this is going to be a big, big attack here as uh, we're just going to pump up this little Sprite Dragon as much as Yutsu Takahashi can. Finds another Expressive Iteration along with two Mystical Disputes. Not the best there just because one of the only getting one card since we're very unlikely to cast mm -hmm. that Mystical Dispute. But the one thing this Kling does is it could gain you three life, could draw you a card, but then also blocks Brazen Bar quite effectively and at least mm -hmm. gets rid of one of them. Um, you know, we're still taking a huge hit for what, like 10? That brainstorm makes it 11. So yeah, I like the choice to get rid of a crackling Drake and just hope that escaping these cling to dust is going to be enough. But yeah, Matt is just hanging on at this point. Yeah. Has to find some good cards off the top of the library. We're going to see another brainstorm here. 
Take a look at a couple extra cards. Expressive iterations will go back on top of the library. Just basically saying, I will never run out of cards. That's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Effectively, yeah. And then brainstorm on the end step if he wants to. This isn't looking good, but there's another Shark Typhoon. What can we cycle into here? A combination of cycle plus a cling to dust would make... Yeah, I think you need more. I like the decision. And was that just a whip? Okay, brainstorm, not bad. Mm -hmm. Not bad. We got to be looking for removal spells, Doom Blade, stuff like that. Not things that cost that much. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a let's talk about that later card. Yeah. For sure. I guess if you cast Narset, you get another shark as a blocker mm -hmm. and just live life on the edge, right? Like anything kind of beats you because, okay, Brainstorm there doesn't, but now we have two blockers, one for the Ox, one for the Sprite Dragon, and the Arclight Phoenix gets through. And now it's how good are these expressive iterations and can you find a shock effect, Brazen yeah. Bar maybe, uh, to clear out one of these sharks, some action spell, but you're seeing a lot of cards with these expressive iterations, so Utah has to whiff pretty badly. Yeah, it's looking very much like Yuta Takahashi's game right now, but stranger things have happened in the world of magic. <laughs> There's an Arc Light Phoenix. Another hasty threat on the battlefield for Yuta finds another expressive iteration. I like that Utah's like, I still got to play max efficiently and play my yeah. draw spell first, even though this arc light is just lethal. Oh, I mean, he's going to go out in style here. Two arc light yeah. phoenixes cost the faithless during discard. I mean, I mean Merry Christmas. He's going to have the whole army out here. And one thing that's true about this is it Phoenix deck that anybody else <laughs> that have played this, it is so fun. It is so fun to draw those many <laughs> cards, get all these fun creatures to come in. It's definitely a blast to play. Oh man, didn't even need the Faithless losing away the Arclight Phoenix is just hard casting them along with the Sprite Dragon and swinging in there for lethal. So, sideboard time. What does Spurling need to get back in this game? Hmm, let's see. Spurling is probably going to go towards these Cerulean Drakes. That seems pretty good. Grafdigger's Cage to shut down um, the Phoenixes. Maybe some Negates. Legion's end only really cleans up Sprite Dragon. That one's probably not good enough, but pretty much what is in the main deck is pretty well set up against these Phoenix decks. Mm -hmm. Just marginal improvements. Um, and then probably seeing some counter spells coming in from Utah. Um, you know, Mystical Disputes, some negates seem like the, the ideal plans, but we'll see what they do. It's going to be interesting to see what the shape of the deck looks like after sideboard. Because we saw in the uh, previous rounds where the deck that wants to be aggressive and like the Ors of Auras deck, it kind of becomes its own worst enemy when it draws too many reactive spells and it doesn't have yes. its proactive game plan that it wants. So I'm interested to see how Utah sideboards here against this Demir control deck. Yeah, that's such a great point. These Is It Phoenix decks have this really weird dynamic where you don't want to get rid of too many of your draw spells because then you're just not doing what your Is It Phoenix does best, and that is casting spells constantly that draw you other cards mm. and then get back your Arclight Phoenix. If you're bringing in a bunch of negates, a bunch of disputes and stuff like that, it just doesn't lead to a very good game plan, and your deck is kind of pulling at two different directions, yeah. and you're not really doing either of the things better than your opponent at that point. And so it's tough to sideboard and you usually want to sideboard pretty minimally. Yeah. And also with like the Demir control deck, it's not doing a whole heck of a lot except saying nope, nope, nope and killing your stuff yes. until it can get to the commence the end games, the massive shark typhoons, because there are no creatures in this deck at all. Yeah, really impressive, you know? I mean, just just really trying to stop Yuta from doing things. And this may be the deck that hard casts Shark Typhoon more than any other deck because <laughs> it is just something that the one giant shark alone mm -mm. can be good enough, but you really just want all your removal spells to come with a shark and then just win by just an absurd amount of sharks flooding the battlefield. Well, let's see if we can take a look at how the players did indeed sideboard before we jump into the action. All right, so that was close. A <laughs> couple of extra spells coming in there in the uh, Improbable Alliance. Yeah, Improbable Alliance, a really good card. At uh, yeah, these are of course are flipped upside down, but the Improbable Alliance are just going wide against these Demir decks. 
pretty strong here. Extinction event can clean up the evens. There mm -hmm. is a lot of evens in this deck. You know, actually, it is kind of split. We have Brazen Bar as an Ox and Stormwing as odds. Um, but the the tokens aren't the end all be all, but they are pretty annoying. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see how annoying they can be as we jump into game number two here. Yuta Takahashi up a game with the Is It Phoenix deck. Matt Sperling leading the pack, trying to maintain that lead with Yusu Takahashi and the likes hot on his heels. Ooh, oh, two Phoenix in hand. You love to see it. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Quickest decision of his life. What would I like to discard? Get out of here, pigeons. Uh, not too many things that are more fulfilling in, in modern day magic than discarding two Arc Light Phoenixes with Faithless Looting on turn one. <laughs> it is... Uh, it is nice. And here, you know, we have the option where Yuta has two spells already, Faithless Looting and Brainstorm. So this seems like one of those turns where you either just want to jam, jam Sprite Dragon or mm -hmm. just say go and use your Brazen Bar to like Petty Theft that Cerulean Drake. But it seems like what you don't want to do in these situations is use one of those one mana spells because you really want to save them for turn three. Yeah. And now you get to look at five extra cards, six counting your draw step to just find one one mana spell. At that point, it's unlucky if you don't hit. Yeah, I mean, with the sheer concentration of the one mana spells in this deck, you got to think <laughs> you're probably going to find it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Ideally, if you can, you'll find a magma spray or a lightning axe, something similar to get rid of. Oh, no, no excuse me. Uh, Cerulean Drake doesn't like any of those things. <laughs> yeah. So the only way that he can deal with it, now that there's two of them, it's a bit more difficult, is to bounce it with a brazen borrower. Or they love them, whichever way you're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a tricky card to work around because there's only so many bounce effects. Yeah. And this gets pretty tricky as well, now having two of them, because before, Cerulean Drake is is fine. You know, it can block uh, Arclight Phoenix and, you know, that brick walls it for mm -hmm. forever, essentially. <laughs> but having two of them and being able to actually kill one every turn or just block both of them and never take damage is yeah. quite strong. So I, I would imagine we see a bounce here. Yep. Brazen Borrower, number one, is going to take care of one of the Cerulean Drakes, ensuring that the Phoenix don't die. And look go. at that. Easy peasy. Finding the third one mana spell and just deciding what's going to go back on top of the library. I am curious, though, if he's maybe considering getting the Stormy Entity out first, but that does, of course, then leave him open to a Graveyard Hate spell. So, yeah. It is pretty tempting because normally, uh, without knowing that there's a bunch of Cerulean Drakes, you you would just cast these Phoenix no matter what, and we easily mm -hmm. might see them coming back anyways. But I agree, there is definitely some temptation to playing the Stormwing Entity and then just scrying away the cards. Yeah, Scry and being able to attack up. through with a, with a pretty beefy threat. But looks like we're going to go for Air Force Phoenix as uh, <laughs> the third spell is cast, Faithless Looting. We'll chuck a couple of extra things into the graveyard, and here come the phoenixes, or phoenixes, however you want to say it. Just have birds. You get some birds. They're coming yes. in. And one thing I want to point out with that Stormwing Entity play is, like, we look at Matt's hand. It's pretty set up to beat a Stormwing Entity on the stack, but that, that hand does not beat. A five drop, you know, and, mm -hmm. and honestly, that's what makes this card so powerful and historic. And honestly, even in modern as well, is there is not that many ways to deal with a five drop that effectively, you know, there's a lot of spells that care about four being the cap mm -hmm. of your converted mana cost. So just a Cerulean Drake and a Mystical Dispute or a Fatal Push being held up by Matt Sperling opts to go for the Mystical Dispute on the Brainstorm and uh, Yusha Takahashi can't pay for it, so is going to have to decide whether or not he wants to fight over this brainstorm resolving. Yeah, I think Yuta had a, a little eyebrow raised there. At first, was just like, wow, that seems aggressive, and I get to bring my storm at wing entity down and then thinks like oh do i even care about saving this brainstorm just decides you know what just playing a storm wing with a dispute backup yep. seems better and i tend to agree i think the storm wing entity looks amazing on this battlefield yeah something that can reliably punch through for damage you know or force the chump lock on the uh the one ones yeah Ooh, and uh, Matt Sperling is not drawing very well at all. It's going to fire off the search for his canter and is going to be met with a mystical dispute that he can't pay for, didn't find an untapped land, 
just had the fetid pools in hand, which you can cycle away or use the fatal push, but things are not looking super good here right now for him. Based on this match alone, I think Matt Sperling is going to go find all his fetid pools he has in his trade binder and rip them up after this because he keeps drawing them when he just needs an untapped land and he'd be fine. But instead, it is tap land after tap land. Oh, no. <laughs> Here we're going to see a swing in with the team. Cerulean Drakes are on chump duty a piece for the Phoenix and... Uh, the Storming Entity is going to get in there for three points of damage, and the follow-up is a Crackling Drake. I was curious to see if we would uh, have one of the Cerulean Drakes die. Uh, yeah, I, I was wondering... Just to get the Fatal Push activation? Yeah, exactly. Or I was just wondering if we were going to see the double block to the Arclight Phoenix, but Matt's mm -hmm. just, th just thinking, you know what, I have these two locked down... For as long as I want, and this deck is so good at putting together three spells when you have five mana, that yeah. is just not worth it. Yeah. Fatal Push takes care of the biggest threat on the battlefield in the Drake. The Sprite Dragon is drawn off the top of the library here, so Yuta's going to go towards Faithless Looting and see how many spells he can chain together to make the Storming Entity as big as possible. Finding a third Arclight Phoenix. Not bad. Oh boy. Not bad. We'll see if, if Yuta wants to risk it. You know, there's so many of these situations where you're you just you just see you're close to it mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, if I faithless looting into any spell, we're on. But then yeah. if you miss, it's like, okay, now even the next turn, it's pretty unlikely that you get to bring it back. So sometimes the risk is worth it, sometimes it's not. And I, I think I'm liking what uh what Yuta's doing here is just giving up on that plan and just saying, you know what, Brazen Borrower at your end step is perfectly fine. Yeah. And and going for that, or you know, maybe rethinking it and going for another Phoenix. Um, it's it's a close one. It's a close one. It makes sense. Utah has taken his time to decide about this one. Yeah. You know, the other option also being Sprite Dragon, but looks like mm -hmm. he looks like he might be going for it. Might be risking it for the biscuit here to get this game over and done as quick as he can. I like it. I like it. Oh, and we hit. Yay! He hits. And That's you a had brainstorm. To just hit a one drop. Uh, cantrip <laughs> as well, you know, kind of had to get, I wouldn't say super lucky, but a little lucky there because you had to yeah. discard that land. So you couldn't hit expressive iteration, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So finding exactly what he needed to get another Arclight Phoenix out of the graveyard and get in even more gas into the graveyard. Oh my goodness me. So nine points of damage here. Oof. I wonder the amount of decks that Yuta plays where he has flying blue creatures. You know, like it has to be like 80% <laughs> of the decks he chooses. It is definitely a style, mm -hmm. and he is just a master at those style of decks, too. So who can blame him? Yeah. The draw there is Field of Ruin for Matt Sperling. He's going to take a look and try and find something to keep him alive. But with four attackers and only two blockers, the other cards are not going to cut it here. He has to brainstorm into, I don't know what even would keep him alive. And the answer is nothing as Yuta Takahashi picks up the victory there against the current rival's leader. So closing that gap there, congratulations to Yuta. Is it Phoenix just proving to be such a powerhouse in Historic, Corey? It really is unbelievable. And I think this was the deck that was so hyped right when Historic... Uh, got the Mystical Archive cards. And then it's been getting a little bit lower and stuff. People have been figuring out how to beat it. But if you don't respect this deck enough, it comes right back similar to the Arclight Phoenixes. <laughs> <laughs> the Phoenix shall rise from the ashes or yes. the graveyard. One sounds cooler <laughs> than the other, but still, you're cooler, equally but... in a bit of a pickle when they do. So my well, friends, so. when we come back, we're going to have plenty more magic after this short break. So don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to the MTG League Weekend, everybody. I'm Ailey Loney alongside Corey Baumeister, and we are going to see two greats of the game, Lockhorns, once again. It is going to be Reed Duke versus Gab Nassif in back. a mirror match of the controlling kind. Ooh, actually, actually it's the mirror. <laughs> you can see yourself out now. Thank you. We had a good yeah. run. Yeah, goodbye. <laughs> All right, now that that's taken care of, let's take a look at the deck lists here, friends. The mirror control, we've just seen it in the hands of Matt Sperling against Yuta Takahashi, who, a uh, quick uh, little tidbit here, has tied it up with Riku Kumagai at 47 points behind Sperling. So, uh, Corey, give us a quick rundown of Demir Control if our friends are just joining us. Yeah, Demir Control, we just saw this deck um, last round in the hands of Matt Sperling, uh, losing to Utah. But now, you know, Reed Duke, and they just all tested together, so playing the exact same deck. The matchup is a lot different now where we're just worried about card advantage. You're worried about sticking Narset still just as much as the round before, but two control decks, and when two control decks get together, you know we're in for a long one. Another yep. really big key card in these matchups are Shark Typhoons, when to cycle them, when to cast them, when to wait to cycle for bigger sharks. That's going to be a big question on all their minds. And when to hard cast them, right? It's always hard yeah. cast if you're talking to Twitch chat. I know that, so yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump in here. We are joining at game number two. Gab Nassif winning the first game against fellow teammate Reed Duke. So let's see how game number two shakes out. Take a quick look at the sideboarding decisions there. Quite a lot coming in for both players and uh, quite a lot coming out. I love that Reed Duke and Nassif have played exact mirror matches. Uh, you know, a lot in these league weekends. <laughs> and it always seems like they have one card that's different. And I used to think it was like play draw, but the more and more I watch, it's just, they have small little, you know, preferences on the yeah. cards they play. And it's really, really interesting to see it play out. Yeah, and you know, from, I don't know, I guess from an analytical point, there's not really a wrong or right answer because yeah. in one game, that card could win it for you. Yeah. In another, it could lose it for you. So... It all just matters Absolutely. at which point in the game you find that card that you brought in from the sideboard. Unless you're asking like kicking, Reed yeah. or Nassif, one of them is going to be like, no, there's a correct answer and it's my way, you know? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. They probably had their <laughs> arguments about it, would be my guess. <laughs> and so both players just being pretty happy getting the uh, the battlefield established. So for us, Kanta is the first permanent down on the battlefield for Reed Duke. So being able to shore up his draws there. Oh, thought distortion. Oh, I want to see that card cost. Yeah, that one of in their sideboards is really going to dictate these games because if each player tries to play coy and just, you know, not really jam anything into the battlefield, just trying to react to their opponent, whoever mm -hmm. gets thought distortion first usually is in a lot of trouble. Yep. Oh man, it's just, it's backbreaking when that card goes off because there's nothing you can do about it. It's like, cool, you have any non-creatures in your hand? Well, they're going away now. Yeah, and I believe I heard you, uh, you know, say last round, be like, there's not a single creature, so I believe it's going to have some good hits, to say the <laughs> least. Well, there is a Kefnet. We have oh, seen, that's true. we've seen the Big Birdie uh, make his appearance, and I, I believe that is it in Reed Duke's hand over there. Yeah, and it is in the sideboard. So game one, there is no creatures, but of course yeah. uh, they both brought it in. It's a powerful card when it lands. And There's now plenty with, of things to do here. Now with another Narset, I wouldn't be too shocked to see Gabriel try to actually go into this. Now the one aspect why he wouldn't want to is Reed has been missing land drops. So if you're missing land drops like this, you really just wait for your opponent to discard to hand size instead of let's say playing Narset and then they just get to instead discard to hand size, counter one of your one of your threats. So uh, I can see reasons for both here. Yeah. So Reed doesn't have, you know, He's not hitting all his lands, but he's able to find them with the help of Search for His Cancer mm -hmm. and does have that Crawling Barons ticking up every single turn. But on the other side of things, Gap and Seif is just, you know, casually making a couple sharks, chipping in here for four points of damage. And that's going to add up after a while, especially now that we have another Shark Typhoon in hand. Yeah, and this is just looking rough. I'm looking at Reed's hand, and Nasif is drawing sharks into sharks into sharks, and Reed is just... 
it doesn't have enough firepower. We even see a shark typhoon go to the graveyard there. Something you would <laughs> never do if you're not missing lands. It's your most important card in these demirrors. And right now, Nasif <laughs> is just, you know, making it look easy, essentially. Oh, yeah, I, I please. I don't even know if it's that good. Oh, oh, he can't, oh. Wait, he can stop it. It can't be counted, but he can say, no, thank you very much. This continuity. No, Whoa. why? Why, yes. Nasif? I wanted to see that cost, and you just ruined my fun. Technically, it was cast. You got your wish. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> oh, man. I want it. Okay, fine. It's fine. That's a very, very good answer to the yeah. spell on the stack. Sure, it can't be counted, but you can just basically say, nope, I don't feel like partaking in this turn anymore. Let's uh, send it along, shall we? Oh, and here we go. Oh, it it's time. Nasif is just really a man for the people so far. I think we've already seen Good him on grief. camera cast like three or four shark typhoons, even one time in the match that Cedric and Marshall were casting where I'm like, I don't know if that is possibly correct to do. And he's still just like, yep. When is it ever wrong, typhoon. Corey? Come on. <laughs> it's never wrong to hard cast a shark typhoon. Unless oh. you're about to die, then, then it's probably wrong. But that is when he cast it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Oh, look at this juicy dispute, too. Even if Ooh. it doesn't work with the other disputes in hand, still a 3-3 three, three shark. Yeah, yeah, that's still a shark. It, this is There's no downside here, really. You get a 3-3 three, oh. three for one mana. Cool. Oh, my. Oh, beautiful draw there. Elf and of Mastery. Nasif knowing that there is no counter spell that counters Balefra Mastery straight up. So leading with Narset here and then going for Balefra is a really smart play and an equally smart play from Reed recognizing that you probably don't want to pay for this at this point if you want to mastery the Kefnet. You got to choose at this point. Yeah, I mean, with another Narset in hand, let's get rid of that pigeon. Let's uh, start swinging in here. My aggressive little brain is just like, move the big birds so that we can hit you with the sharks. But, yeah. you know... Gabnasif thinks otherwise, and Narset is down on the battlefield, takes a look at a Shark Typhoon, a Search for his Canter, and a Drown in the Loch. What do you go for here? You know, I'm not 100%. I think we've played a land from Nasif. If we haven't played a land, it seems pretty awesome to just Drown in the Loch and just kill Kefnet. It's mm -hmm. such a tempo swing. And uh, just attack for with a bunch of sharks. And it's just there like, how, how are you going to beat this without things like Extinction Event being left in? Because they're so bad in most scenarios. But you just really can't beat this battlefield with how their post-board configurations are lined up. Reed Duke just missed far too many land drops. Oh, my goodness. They, this this is a disgusting battlefield, by the way. Just look at the, some <laughs> these sharks. <laughs> Ah, oh, hardcore shark typhoon, never change. Search for his canter, doing its best on Reed Duke's side of things. You thought, yeah, okay, he's he's looking pretty good here. Now I've got a flip search, but he doesn't have a shark army in the sky. And he doesn't have a way to deal with it either, unless Narset gets super lucky. I don't even know if he's got a uh, an exile effect. We're gonna find out. Extinction event or Legion's end if you leave them if you bring them in. And I mean I remember looking at Ugh. what they sideboarded and they did not. Oh, no. That's not... Uh, doesn't keep him alive. I don't think so. Yeah, chomp, chomp, chomp. The sharks are feasting. Yeah, it's Reed feeding Duke's time. Total at this point, and that's it. Goodness me. Gab Nassif winning in spectacular fashion there with the army of sharks, and there was nothing that Reed Duke could do 